Thank you everyone for being here today. My name is Judith Plank and we're all very excited about our program and we're thrilled to have you here to share it with us. Uh, we're going to start with a welcome and a few words by someone who needs little introduction in this town, Mayor Joe Cravoza. Thank you very much, uh, Judith. Uh, wonderful to be here. And actually, I think I need my sheet. I need my sheet to recognize other elected officials. Ah. All right, uh, first, because she helped out, uh, from the Davis School Board, uh, Sheila Allen, and I think we have Tim Taylor here as well, Sheila and Tim. Also from the school board, Winfred Robeson, who will be on, Winfred will be on the panel uh, in just a little bit. Uh, my colleagues, Winfred? Uh, my colleagues on the city council, uh, we have uh, Lucas Frerichs uh, here, and Dan Wolk uh, is with us as well, I'm Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, delighted to have State Senator Lois Wolk with us. Uh, where's Lois? Lois. Uh, Ellie Fairclaw is here representing Mike Thompson. Ellie, great to have you. Jo all right, well, that's the end of me right there. Uh, John Garamendi, thank you. And uh, she has been vertically integrated. Okay, very good. All right, quit while I'm not too far behind. Okay, uh, thank you all for joining us uh, today. Um, I'm pleased to welcome everybody to our annual celebration of Martin Luther King's legacy. I'm also particularly pleased to welcome uh, Dana Vickers Shelley, who's here from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, I've been humbled. I've been humbled to follow the work of Morris Dees, who is the great civil rights litigator who founded the Southern Poverty Law Center. And so to have Dana here today is very special. I want to thank the organizers of the, this event, uh, certainly Judith and the Human Relations Commission. And I want to thank the high school students for being here today to report out on their research uh, among us. I want to begin by recognizing three uh, individuals that have left us in this uh, past year. First, Nelson Mandela, of course, who brought his people together and healed a nation, and he also had a significant impact worldwide, nationwide, on the struggles of all uh, for the development of justice and certainly influenced my own personal ethos. We also lost a great friend in Terry Turner, and we're going to recognize Terry uh, as this program continues on uh, today. And also, I want to recognize uh, a very dear friend of mine, a Davisite that, that some of you knew and many of you didn't. Uh, he was a world-famous illustrator. His name was Jan Nashimbeni. And Jan grew up, uh, he passed away in February in Mexico, uh, Jan grew up with every material advantage uh, that you might imagine. He was the son of two huge industrial families uh, in Italy and France, uh, but he largely grew up alone. And his art reflected the great need to connect children and welcome children into society. And that's a theme that I'm gonna talk about a little bit in my short remarks here. Now, as I thought on this year's King celebration, uh, I kept thinking of the letter from the Birmingham jail. In college, a friend of mine gave me a recording of King from the jail as he recorded it. Uh, King had been arrested for civil disobedience. He was in jail and he was trying to explain to the local clergy uh, why he had done what he had done. And when he was uh, in jail and as he wrote that letter, he delivered his kind of great quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We all know that. But it followed with something that's not repeated quite as much, and that is we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So as your mayor uh, and in the connection with our local government, it makes me wonder what can I do, what can we do as a city government to support the mutuality that we all must have to build a better society? And I'm very proud to say uh, that we do that uh, in the city of Davis. 
there are all kinds of different pieces. We have our Human Relations Commission, and now we have their wonderful Breaking the Silence of Racism event that inaugurated this past December. We have our ombudsman at the police department to make sure that those who think they were wronged by the police uh, have a fair hearing immediately, and quite frankly, on the city's dime. We have our Golden Heart and our Win Awards to make sure we recognize those uh, reaching out to others in our community and fighting for justice. And certainly we have this MLK Day as well. We're also joined on an institutional basis by our school district. We have schools in Cesar Chavez, Korematsu, and Holmes named for those who fought for justice. We have our wonderful race and social justice program at the high school, which we'll hear from uh, today. We have the Black Student Union at the high school. On campus, we have the UC Davis Cross Cultural Center, which does so much to connect students on campus and connect them to the community. But I also want to recognize that it's not governmental institutions that truly create our fabric, truly create the mutuality that we all need. That rests upon all of you and the great work that you do in so many different organizations. So we have our international house and our international festival to celebrate the diversity of our community. We have BECA, the Blacks for Effective Community Action that are active. We have our interfaith rotating winter shelter and all of the wonderful work of Davis Community Meals and others to take care of those who have less in our community. We have the Davis Peace Coalition. We now have the Phoenix Coalition. Uh, we have the Concilio of Yolo County, and we have the Yolo Interfaith Immigration Network. We have a very, very strong network creating the, muni the mutuality that King all called upon us to advance. And they bring us to the great King quote then, that everybody can be great because everybody can serve. And so many in this community do exactly that. Three years ago on this occasion, January of 2011, uh, I had the privilege of making my first public address as the mayor of Davis. I reflected on attending President Obama's first inauguration, how the historical echo of Dr. King's message on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial was coming alive on the inaugural stage. What we've learned from Obama and his years in office is that the arc of justice will be long. It won't be achieved by one president, no matter how articulate and no matter how well positioned. But when someone like President Obama comes into our world and he calls for the best in all of us, we need to seize the opportunity and move our community and our nation forward. We have that power to continue the legacies left to us by Nelson Mandela and by Terry Turner and the example provided by Barack Obama, all of whom have made Dr. King's echo louder and louder as we go forward. And that is our challenge here in Davis. In the mutuality of our collective actions, we must do what we all can to amplify Dr. King's echo. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you to Judith again. It's great to have everybody here. I can't wait for the program and the Freedom March to follow. Thank you, Mayor Provoza. I just want to remind everyone that tomorrow night at 6 p.m. in the community chambers, Mayor Crovoza will give the State of the City Address, uh, and it will be covered by Davis Media Access, as, as always. So one of the aspects of this event today uh, that is very important to us is making sure that we include uh, the, the voices of young people in our community. In addition, our entire program today focuses on education of minority youth. Luckily, with Davis High School's race and social justice class, we have high school students who are learning about social justice issues um, each year. Today, we're going to hear from a group of seniors who completed a research project as part of that class. Please join me in welcoming Sydney Carrera, Robin Hansen, Avery Lasher Posner, Emily Pachuila and Christina Puente uh, to share with us their research on socioeconomic class and academic achievement. So um, this is our presentation on socioeconomic class and academic achievement.
So we decided to define socioeconomic class as the way in which society is divided into certain classes based upon similarities in social, economic, or educational status. The problem that we are trying to address through this presentation is if an individual's socioeconomic class affects their academic achievement in school. Our motivation to solve this problem is that we have noticed unequal wealth distribution has limited people's opportunities to excel. And we hope through this presentation to help create ways for the less fortunate to reach their full academic potential. Okay. Um, so we did some research of some evidence of how socioeconomic class affects academic achievement through our country's history. So some factors that we found of how socioeconomic class affects academic achievement is one, the school, their peers, relationships between teachers and their family background. Starting off with one's peers is if they um, hang out with a good group of friends, um, not going down like a bad path, not getting into trouble, and staying on a good path, um, that'll impact their future. And relationships between teachers and their family is um, a lot of times if you have a good relationship with your teachers, you're more motivated to do better and really try to achieve that high grade. But, um, and then the other way is if you don't have a good relationship, you might um, not try to do as well and maybe slack off a little. And with your family background, if you have like a good upbringing and have a good relationship with your parents and siblings, um, you're more likely to try and succeed in school. And so these certain aspects, or these certain factors that we found could determine one's future after school and their potential jobs. So as the Great Depression hit America, um, many educational institutions um, simply disappeared. Education became many families' lowest priority. Um, as you can see, the overall dropout rates increased to 76%. And it's not because these kids didn't want to go to school, it's because these educational institutions were no longer available. Makeshift schools were created, but these makeshift schools did not have the same type of education that regular schools did and schools that the more wealthy kids went to. Um, and like I said, on the other side of the spectrum, a lot of these wealthy kids just continued to go to school because they had more opportunities, more resources and more time and money to continue their education and not have to worry about maybe finding jobs or money or having food for their family. During the Great Recession, the middle class was the most affected. The poor stayed poor and the wealthy stayed wealthy, but it was the middle class that was hit the hardest. The grades of students in the middle class were greatly affected, they dropped, and they dropped dramatically. During the recession, test scores dropped on an average of 6%, and the test scores of students that had high test scores and were already accepted into college dropped about 20%. Um, so there have been a lot of studies recently that have addressed this problem, and one such study was done by Stanford University. And what that study found was that the achievement gap has increased between 30 and 40% com now compared to how it was in the 1970s and that there is an increasing income distribution gap between the 90th and 10th percentile. And um, they offered some theories for why this may be occurring, and some of those were that um, those that are wealthier have a lot more resources, like money, time, to invest in their child's education, so that tends to take a priority. And um, they also, uh, those that are wealthier, generally more educated, and um, uh, so they, uh, put a lot of focus on education for their children. And um, those that are, are children from wealthy families tend to uh, receive a lot of pressure from their parents to succeed in school, so that plays into effect how they do. Whereas those who are um, not as wealthy uh, tend to, their parents may not put as much focus or have as much time um, into their education. As you can see on the screen, um, the classes that we surveyed were both sophomore and junior English classes. We tried to make our surveys as varied as possible, ranging from regular English 10 
to American Literature Honors. Okay, as you can see, this is the survey that we distributed to the different English classes. We wanted qualitative and quantitative data. For our quantitative data, we asked students what grade they were in, what they estimated their GPA to be, and what socioeconomic class they thought they were in. We did not give the definition of socioeconomic class to these students because we wanted to see where they thought they fell on the, on the ratio. Um, some, for quantitative, or qualitative data, some students said, um, they said how um, their class affected their academic achievement. One student said, I feel like I cannot participate in everything because, um, I want to because of financial difficulty. Another said, I'm able to hire a good tutor if needed, and I can get all the materials I need, like a computer and a good calculator, etc. Another said, my socioeconomic class helps me in school. Many academic activities rely on money. Out of the eight students that we surveyed who self-identified as being a part of the low socioeconomic class, um, you can see that the GPAs range greatly. Um, and I want you guys to pay close attention to the purple square or the purple quarter of this pie graph because it is, will disappear in the next couple slides and that means that they have a GPA less than a 1.9. 155 students identified themselves as being in the middle socioeconomic class. As you can see, the percentage of students with a GPA of a 3.0 or higher has increased dramatically since the last slide, and the percentage of students with a lower, with a GPA lower than a 2.0 has decreased, showing that students have much more academic um, resources than the other class. So of the students who identified as being in the high socioeconomic class, um, they generally did very, very well in school. 92% um, had above a 3.0, um, which we would generally identify as being successful in school. And um, when we, for our qualitative data, a lot of them um, said that their parents valued higher education a lot and that they pushed them to be successful in school and they gave them all the things they needed to to succeed in school, like tutors, prep classes, things like that, which allowed them to be successful. Um, so uh, you can see our um, three graphs put together. And if you look at the low socioeconomic class, class which is on the bottom left, 62% have above a 3.0. And then if you go to the middle, which is um, on the right, it bumps up to 86%. And then if you look at the high socioeconomic class, it bumps up to 92%. You can see like the variation in the amount of children who are succeeding. And then you, if you also look at the purple, which um, represents less than a 2.0, it starts at 25% for the low, and then it goes to a little over 1% and to non-existent in the high class, uh, in the high socioeconomic class, which shows that um, those that are wealthy are getting the opportunities and the things they need to succeed, whereas those who are um, not as wealthy aren't, may not be getting those same opportunities. So in conclusion to our research, we found that uh, these opportunities are not presented equally to the lower classes as they are to the higher classes. Therefore, that is why these higher, or the kids, the students that associate with the higher socioeconomic classes tend to get higher GPAs. So for solutions to this issue, we promoted the Academic Center, which is on campus, and it offers free tutoring as well as free technological resources. We did this advertising by putting up posters and flyers, as well as passing out a, a PowerPoint presentation to the teachers to show to their students. Um, so after our presentation, we kind of took a look at the Davis community and thought of ways that our community was allowing students to um, not be given the same opportunities. And one of those ways we found was with the GATE program, which allows, um, if parents have the same fina have fin financial resources, to um, have their child privately tested, which is allowing those with money to have access to a program which has, where those who do not have the same resources, they can't. So, which isn't right. <laughs> Overall, our outcome
outcomes, we were hoping that students will become more informed about the resources available to them, and hopefully the academic achievement gap between the high and low classes will lessen. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was just fantastic. Let's give another hand. Round of applause. Fabulous. Now we're going to turn our attention to additional voices in the community in a panel discussion on education issues. Fellow Human Relations Commissioner David Greenwald will be moderating the panel, which includes Ken Barnes, who works at the UC Davis Internship and Career Center, and who is also a trustee for a Robles school district in Sacramento. And I don't know if Laurel Cato is here. Uh, Laurel Cato, a Davis High School student. Esther Ebuehi and Mariah Watson, both UC Davis students. And last but not least, Winfred, <laughs> Winfred Roberson, let me say that right, who is the superintendent of the Davis Joint Unified School District. David, I'll turn it over to you. I'd like to welcome our panel. Hi, my name is David Greenwald. I'm a member of the Davis Human Relations Commission. Um, for the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to uh, have a, a panel discussion on education and minority youth. And because we have four panelists and limited time, I'm going to cut you off pretty quickly. Um, so, uh, Winfred, um, the first question is for you, um, and try to keep it to about two minutes or so. Um, what factors are, achieve, are affecting the achievement gap among students of different cultural and social economic backgrounds, particularly African American students at DJUSD? Thanks, Dave. Uh, I'm going to squeeze this into my two minutes. I have to acknowledge the students that did a wonderful job there. In fact, <laughs> Prior to Davis schools, and I appreciate the work, research that they have done. In fact, they, they laid out much of what I wanted to talk about. Um, they've identified what the achievement gap is, and that's this, this observed long disparity between the performance, uh, the, the evaluation of performance of students, especially those um, in relationship to socioeconomics as well as race and ethnicity. We first became aware of this in, in 1966 when the federal government issued our, our commission, the Coleman Report. Uh, they identified the two factors, what takes place at home and what takes place at school. So those are the two factors that, that um, have contributed to the, to the gap. So right now, we, the economics we cannot ignore. Also in school, there are conditions that lead to uh, the a gap. There's lots of research out there, some of that done by Mole as well as Gonzalez that looks at the funds of knowledge. Some of the things that we can do is begin to get to know our students and not know about them, but to learn from them. Um, Dil um, Dilbert and her research looking at other people's children talks about the disparity of power, the distribution of power, who has the power, the mainstream setting the bar for what power looks like, giving that power out. And so in um, the book Funds of Knowledge by Gonzalez, she does some, some very profound research showing teachers going into the homes of students, learning about their rich culture, the, uh, the cognitive resources that are in that home, not just learning about them, but learning from them. We're talking about a distribution of power, shared power versus empowerment. So these are And Winfred, I've got to cut you off here. Okay, um, I, I understand. 
Um, so the next question is going to be for both Esther and Mariah. Um, how have you navigated being an African American in a predominantly white and Asian American institution? Uh, so uh, Esther, could you go first? Okay. Hello. Um, well, okay, I don't have time to really give an introduction, but I kind of feel the need to. Um, I'm a second year student at UC Davis, currently uh, double majoring in human development and econ. I hope to go into law and public health in the future. Um, and Mariah and I are both involved in student government. Mariah is a senator and I'm a commissioner on uh, Ethnic and Cultural Affairs Commission. Um, and to answer your question, uh, being at Davis, was the demographics of UC Davis are not too far off from the demographics at my high school um, and middle schools that I went to. So in terms of like primary education through secondary and higher education, um, not really, there wasn't much of a change. So coming to Davis, the biggest thing I did was kind of reach out for my people, reach out for my community um, by joining organizations. Um, I joined a scholars program right off the bat um, that targeted um, African American students and scholars on campus. And I think that was an awesome, formidable experience for me. Um, just to see people who look like me, who understand my struggles, um, who understand what it's like to be the 3% on campus. Um, and uh, that's probably the biggest, the biggest way I kind of navigated um, through the campus, but it wasn't like a culture shock, it wasn't this dramatic um, experience for me as a freshman, um, that's just my experience. Okay. Hello everyone, as Esther stated, I am an ASUCD senator, I am a second year international relations major emphasizing in peace and security, as well as Middle Eastern South Asian studies, and I would like to be a lawyer and go into the State Department one day, fingers crossed. <laughs> Uh, so Esther definitely echoed a lot of the things that I was going to say, which helps with this two-minute period to get all this through. Uh, one thing that I do, and I know a lot of other students do it, is I refuse to let my race or my ethnicity or the way that people perceive me stop me from achieving what I want. You know, running for Senate was huge. Oh. Uh, you know, as Esther stated, we are less than 3% on our school, and a lot of times people talk about these voting blocks, like I'm going to have this finite amount of people who are guaranteed to vote for me and things of that nature, and it's just being able to be in different spaces and get good grades. I've been on the dean's list every single quarter. I have almost a 4.0. I mean, and I attribute this to the fact that I refuse to let these preconceived notions of what I'm supposed to be at this campus. It's the difference between, oh goodness, you all are so amazing. Um, it's the difference between surviving and thriving. And it's getting yourself out there. It's getting out of your comfort zone. It's looking back and saying, yes, I am alone in the classroom most of the time. And there is no one who looks like me, but I'm going to push out of that box and push those barriers and show them that I am just as capable, I am just as brilliant, and I will be successful in this university. And so that's how I navigate. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Ken Barnes, um, what do you think is essential in attracting and then retaining students of color, and particularly African Americans, within our post secondary educational system? in two minutes. <laughs> well, I actually had prepared to answer this in two separate questions. I'll try to be brief, and I'll give accolades to the high school students that did the research on this because it was, it was phenomenal. When it comes to attracting students, can you guys move okay. okay. When it comes to attracting students, I'll break it down to... How's this? Yeah. Oh, okay. When it comes to attracting students, I'll break it down to two categories uh, real briefly. First is uh, attracting high school seniors who are ready to go to college. Uh, for them, I'd say making UC Davis relevant to them. These students, they, 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 read, they listen to the news, they, they know the reports about the job market, so they know that it's going to be tough when they graduate. So we need to make their education relevant, make sure that when they come here and they get an education, uh, they, are, they have the tools to get an advanced degree, and then once they graduate, they have the tools to to be competitive with the other students out there that are going to Berkeley and Stanford and all the other, other campuses. So making that education relevant, what is it about UC Davis that is unique enough to give them that competitive edge when they graduate? So that's the first part. The second part of that is getting students prepared for education. That is in the K-12 system. And I'm, I am a school board member on an elementary school district. 
I like focusing on that area because that is a very key area, especially up until third grade. And we'll try to be brief here, but uh, studies show that if a student isn't performing at advanced or, or near advanced by third grade, the chances of getting into college are very slim. And actually, if they're performing below uh, proficiency and, and far below proficiency, the chances of them getting into a uh, state institution that they don't want to get into is far more likely. So we need to dedicate more resources there to making sure that our students are prepared at an early age or are on track to get into college. And the uh, Common Core, the California Common Core Standards, uh, seems to be uh, going in that right direction. But it's a very new system, so we're going to have to monitor that and see if that's actually very uh, actually successful. If not, then we'll have to make changes along the way. Perfect. <laughs> All right, back to Winfred. Um, what is being done to track effectiveness of programs and policies designed to close the achievement gap? Thanks, Dave. Uh, currently, our teachers and administrators are meeting as often as possible through collaboration. They're a great level where they come together to examine student data, uh, data through our CSTs, as well as assessments that have been conducted in the classroom to see where students are performing. Counselors have an opportunity to take a look at grade point averages as, as well as uh, the number of students that are going into college, applying to college, uh, to determine are we uh, effectively giving all of our students access to the courses as well as materials that are going to set them on a pathway for college and career readiness. So um, also, our teachers, uh, as well as the school district, has a, with the, with the CSTs going away and the STAR going away, which is a new change taking place in education and the uh, introduction of the Common Core, we have an opportunity to find other ways that we want to begin to track and look at the success of our students. So uh, this, this is going to present a great opportunity for us. Okay, um, and we go back to Esther and Mariah for another question. Have you had experiences in the Davis community, either on campus or in the city, uh, that you feel were discriminatory or made you feel uncomfortable as an African American? And if the answer is yes, could you please provide an example? Esther? Well, the answer is definitely yes. Um, it's, it's hard to pinpoint just one, and I feel like that's probably the most disappointing thing about people asking that question, is when you have to figure out, well, am I gonna talk about that time in the classroom? Am I gonna talk about that time when I was driving home late at night and I was pulled over and we're not even gonna get into that one? Or do we talk about the experiences with our other students? Um, it happens and it's real and a lot of people when you report these things you talk to higher like admin or things of that nature who don't necessarily understand they brush it off or they say things that oh it's okay it's just this is an isolated incident and it's like no when you go into a party and racial slurs start coming up or these things called microaggressions where people use a certain type of language or certain type of tone with just you and not other people who don't look like you and it's, it's even those little things that make me feel very uncomfortable on campus. It's when I am called racial slurs, it's when I am in a classroom and I feel like I can't voice my opinion about a slide or a presentation or something that is showing my race in a very, very negative light when that is not the whole picture. And I feel like we get fed that so much that this is what you look like. This is who you need to be afraid of. And being the only person in the classroom, feeling so uncomfortable that I called my mother crying once I left saying, I don't know what to do, that, that's, it's real and it happens and there are multiple instances of it. You can just ask pretty much anyone on the campus. Um, and I'm just gonna leave it at that. Did um, you wanna add something? Yeah, I was gonna say Mariah brought up an awesome point about administration and students feeling these uh, feelings of discomfort on campus. Um, and as, as we're standing here as black women, there are other people who are not represented. Um, this is MLK, this is an MLK commemoration, but 
when we talk about like racial slurs or injustices on campus that affect a lot of people of color. Um, and a lot of the time administration doesn't recognize that and that it's really unfortunate, but it's important to validate that some people may feel discomfort on campus, in classes, at parties, whatever the case may be, and that contributes to how we feel about UC Davis. Personally, I, I have had a lot of negative experiences and it doesn't really help to get into that and get into that like headspace, but um, from that, like I do really think solidarity, especially within our community, is huge because when stuff like that happens, I can find Mariah, who I work with, or I find uh, my friends, uh, people that I see on a daily basis who understand my own struggles, and we can kind of work things out together. And that has happened a lot in the past year, and I find that so commendable within the black community at UC Davis that we can band together when you know injustices happen or you know scandals happen, and we can kind of find like strength with one another. So, I mean, to kind of like throw this and flip it around, you know, that's a positive side of it, that we can find solidarity within our community in that way. And for Ken Barnes, um, what are the racial factors affecting em employment for African American graduates? <laughs> Again in two minutes. That's a tough question to answer. Um, I say probably uh, very similar to the to the fact of um, affecting employment in, in other areas. And right now, I say one, the job market is very tough, uh, and two, uh, are we matching what the students are studying to where their jobs are? And right now, I'd say we're probably not doing a very good job at that. If you look at where the jobs are, the jobs are right now are in STEM: science, technology, engineering, and math. And right now, predominantly, we don't see a lot of African Americans gravitating to that area. Okay? And uh, I say a, a better question is why do we not see a lot of students, a lot of African American students, gravitating to those areas? Part of that has to be um, has to deal with the preparation, or um, first at the K-12 level, and then also at the Davis level. And I've seen uh, uh, I am on a committee that, that that looks into the retention of African American students at Davis, and I have to say that uh, some of the things that, that it has brought to light are pretty shocking, like uh, uh, first year students who are told by their academic advisor that they need to take 16, 18 or more units in very hard science classes. And just as the high school students here have shown in their research, if you don't have those resources and, those, and the parents behind you pushing you, you're not gonna be very good in, in those areas. Uh, so we, we have uh, students that are being told to take 16 to 18 units of hardcore science courses in their first and second quarters here and they don't do very well. And so then they get behind not only in their grades, but also in their minimum progress. So they have two strikes against them in their first year, and then they're on their way out. So we're not preparing them for the job market by not preparing them for the, the, the jobs that, uh, that are actually out there by making sure that they're successful while they're here. Thank you. So really quickly, I want to go across the panel in just one minute each. Um, I want, want you to lay out what you think the biggest challenge for African Americans in, in your respective field. So uh, starting with Winfred. Uh, thanks, Dave. You've, we've already mentioned the economic piece. Um, we cannot ignore it. There is a, there is a difference in access that students with means have versus those that do not. Uh, not only the, the financial resources, but also access to the discourse before students get to school. We recognize that some students come to school, uh, students from middle class families come with academic language. They come already prepared with that discourse. Um, the also, just, and I'll, I'll go back to, and hopefully bring some clarity to the former statement about us really getting to know and learn from our students. So it is, typically students come, we part the knowledge to them, we set and let them know what they should know and why they should know it. Our students come to us with rich cognitive skills that we as, inst as an institution have not tapped into or recognized. Um, so it, it begs for us to get to learn from our students, to learn their rich culture, as well as the cognitive skills that they have, incorporate that into how we begin to teach our students and begin to share this, this uh, knowledge of power. Um, 
I gotta cut you off there. Um, Esther, uh, biggest challenge uh, for an African American student? Can I? Nope. Let me just. Um, that's a pretty loaded question. I can only speak for myself and my own experience and how I feel about being a student at UC Davis. Um, I think, well, the, the first thing that came to mind was um, the amount of students on campus. And there aren't a lot of us on campus. Sometimes it's kind of nice because um, we have that. I guess like, I don't know, it's like this mysterious like, oh, and then when you meet, you know, another black person, it's like, oh, hey, and it's like, we have this like awesome, close, tight-knit community because of it. We don't really have a choice though, you know, I mean, less than 3% of us, so we have to be close and tight-knit, but um, I do think it would be awesome if I saw more black faces on campus, more black scholars on campus, like I'm inspired by all the upperclassmen I know. It's really incredible to like have that, uh, what's the word, example to look up to, especially when I was an incoming freshman and I had no idea what college was really like. Um, and you know, as Ken Barnes brought up, uh, STEM majors, I do know a lot of STEM majors. It might not seem like there are a lot in the, in the community, but I know a lot of STEM majors and they're all incredible um, and just great scholars. So when it comes to like having black students on campus, that's probably my biggest, my biggest qualm with um, our demographics as students. Um, but uh, I think, Currently, I'm, I'm pretty content, I, I feel like, with that. But um, I know that's a huge issue um, that's been brought up with the UC system in general. Um, and uh, when we both went I to- I gotta cut you off. Uh, <laughs> Mariah. <laughs> Goodness gracious. <laughs> it's interesting, when you said field, I was thinking about my profession, I wasn't thinking about myself as a student, so bringing it back. Uh, biggest issue, I'm just gonna have to echo some of the same things that Esther said, and it's, Encouragement, I feel like, is one of our biggest things. And sometimes encouragement isn't a pat on the back or, oh, you can do this. It's having people in the positions that you want to eventually get to, having them there, and looking at it as simple as, I can be there too. You know, when President Obama was elected, I, I don't know how it was for everyone else, but I was sitting there crying, just baffled that I could one day hold that office. I could one day be there. And it's just seeing someone there who looks like you, who has possibly had shared experiences in those spaces that just gives you a whole nother level of like empowerment to get there and work there. Because if they made it, then maybe by some chance, some opportunity, I can make it too. So. And Ken, to wrap it up. I will try not to repeat what has already been said. I'll say that one of the biggest challenges facing African American students now is knowing, uh, knowing that students have resources and knowing what those resources are when you need them. And this is from the K-12 level and at the college level. At the K-12 level, our parents definitely need to know what resources the district offers and how to tap into to those resources to make sure that their, their children are succeeding. And then at the university level, uh, students need to know that they have resources and that when they start to get in trouble, and this, as soon as they start to get into trouble, whatever that trouble is, that they ha can access those resources and get the help that they need. A lot of times students don't feel that they do have access to resources or know where they are, and by the time you get around to helping them, it's too late. They're already on their way out, and you could have helped them uh, far before. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like uh, to thank our panel for their participation. Another round of applause to the panel. Okay, and thank you, David, for facilitating. Um, now, yeah, thank you, David, for facilitating. <laughs> now, before I introduce the keynote speaker, I have a little bit of an announcement. Uh, Assemblywoman Mariko Yamada is here with us today. Welcome. And what she has brought with her is a certificate of recognition uh, from the California Legislature Assembly to the City of Davis Human Relations Commission. 
for in commemoration of the 20th annual Martin Luther King Jr. celebration. This is a wonderful um, placard, uh, plaque here and we appreciate it so much. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman <laughs> Yamada. And I want to read what it says, a quote from, from Martin Luther King. It says, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Wonderful. Okay, on that note, and without further ado, we're in for a special treat. For those of you who are not familiar with it, the Southern Poverty Law Center, located in Montgomery, Alabama, is one of the country's most famous and successful nonprofit civil rights organizations. They fight hate and bigotry and work throughout our nation's schools to promote tolerance. Uh, their unrelenting pursuit to ensure that our next generation of leaders embodies Dr. King's dream is just one of the reasons we are so excited to have Ms. Dana Vickers Shelley uh, of the center here with us today. Ms. Shelley is the Public Affairs Director for the Southern Poverty Law Center. In this role, she uses her skills and strength as a communicator to put the center's messages of tolerance and their fight against bigotry to work. Her career is long and impressive. You can read about several of her past efforts in the program. She has traveled the country to share a message of acceptance, tolerance, and equality. And today we are so very fortunate to have her travel to us here in Davis. Please join me in a hearty welcome to, uh, to Ms. Dana Vickers Shelley. And most importantly, happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day. I really appreciate this invitation and the opportunity to talk with you about a lot of the issues that we've begun today. Um, one of the things I think in, in talking about Dr. King and thinking of education as the civil rights issue of our time is a challenge I would put forward that in addition to thinking of how individuals can change what they do to improve educational outcomes and opportunities for themselves and their families, but to also think about, and I'll talk about this a little bit this morning, the systemic issues that affect kids of color, communities of color, and disinvested communities because many of the things that we have talked about today that the young students have shared with us that the future presidents, ambassadors, and secretaries of state have shared with us today are that, are that it's up to an individual to make a contribution in her or his life, but we also have to address again, those institutional and those structural barriers to those individual success and opportunities. The work that this community has done and that many communities are doing, focusing on eliminating hate and discrimination is so important. As we mark the holiday in honor of Dr. King, and I think uh, this morning there were over 179 million um, Google hits on Martin Luther King Jr. Day 2014, would it surprise you to know that schools in the United States are more segregated today than they have been in four decades? According to a recent study from the Civil Rights Project of UCLA, Millions of non-white students are locked into what's called dropout factory high schools where huge percentages of them don't graduate and few are well prepared for their future in the U.S. economy. American schools are 44% non-white as minorities rapidly emerge as the majority of public school students in the U.S. 
in Latino and African American populations, two of every five students attend intensely segregated schools. For Latinos, this increase in segregation reflects growing residential segregation. For blacks, a significant part of the reversal reflects the ending of desegregation plans in public schools throughout the nation. Way back when, when Brown v. Board of Education, the Supreme Court concluded that the Southern standard of separate but equal was inherently unequal and did irreversible harm to black students. It later extended that ruling to Latinos. In this context, again, our conversation about education, particularly access to quality education as it pertains to public schools and later access to college is an important civil rights issue. Passed just 10 years after Brown v. Board, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, or national origin in programs or activities related to, and that include federal funding. This includes housing, transportation, and of course, education. And over the next year, you'll be hearing a lot about the markers of the civil rights movement because we're in, 19, in, in, in 2014, marking the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Freedom, the 50th anniversary of Dr. King earning the Nobel Prize. A core belief of our democracy is the notion that it is right and fair that all children, regardless of skin color, should have the opportunity for an education. The opportunities for education that I've been fortunate to, to receive come as a result both of that history as well as my personal family history where born the daughter of a high school English teacher and an elementary school librarian, I had no choice but to think of education as something important and essential to my success. One of Dr. King's first comments on education written many years ago when he was a student at Morehouse University in Atlanta Quote, it seems to me that education has a twofold function to perform in the life of man and in society. Remember, it was 1948. The one is utility and the other is culture. Education must enable a man to become more efficient to achieve with increasing facility the legitimate goals of his life. As Dr. King and others fought for civil rights and providing access to everyone regardless of what you look like, where you come from, or what you believe. The Pew Research Center, which many of you may be familiar with, recently reported that fewer than half, 45% of Americans surveyed last year said they believe the United States has made substantial progress toward racial equality since 1963, when Dr. King delivered his I Have a Dream speech. How, how disconcerting is that? Roughly half of Americans, 49%, said a lot more needs to be done to achieve racial equality. So we all have our work cut out for us. Broken down by race, a higher share of blacks, 79%, than Hispanics, 48%, and whites, 44%, felt that way. We've definitely made progress, and yet so many young people don't enjoy the same basic rights as safety from violence when so many children lack the educational opportunities they deserve there's a lot for all of us to do. The civil rights movement that desegregated American schools may have happened several decades ago, but some say segregation and discrimination have slowly resurfaced over the years in a new form. Segregation based on race and income. And again, our panelists and the students' research point in that direction as well. At the Southern Poverty Law Center, we were really heartened and pleased by the Obama administration's announcement a couple of weeks ago about the new guidelines that aim to stop what is called the schools to prison pipeline or push out of children, primarily black and brown children, primarily black and brown boys from the classroom. This schools to prison pipeline ruins the lives of thousands of children who basically do little more than act like kids in school. The reality is that, in the Deep South at least, these policies carry the terrible legacy of Jim Crow. 
While education was per forbidden under slavery, slaves risk life and limb to educate themselves. That's a part of American history. Slaves who were discovered to have learned, to have learned to read, were abused, were beaten. Desegregation in elementary schools, high schools, was one of the core components of the civil rights movement, and our focus on education was a primary focus of reconstruction efforts that happened right after the Civil War. So this quest for quality, fair education, access to educational opportunities has been something that many people have tried to keep the African-American community, African-American students and children away from for hundreds of years. During Reconstruction, more than 3,000 freedmen schools were created across the country, and the first colleges, now considered historically black colleges and universities, Howard University in Washington, D.C., Fisk University in Tennessee, and Hampton in Virginia are all examples of this. The end of Reconstruction saw the gradual unraveling of education for African American children in the South, culminating in 19, 1897's decision on Plessy v. Ferguson, which said suffered by equal was great. The doctrine further institutionalized inequality and the racial divide of the United States, paving the way for more dismantling of schools, cutting off resources, and more violence. And today we still see that cutting off of resources to schools that are predominantly serving black and Latino children. With the Brown v. Board decision, the court recognized that with young people, race-based segregation, quote, generates a feeling of infer inferiority as to their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely to ever be undone. Race-based segregation generates a feeling of inferiority in young people's status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely to ever be undone. How can we treat our future leaders in this manner? Today, there are efforts across the country trying to repeal Brown v. Board. In the South and in other parts of the country, legislatures are looking at opportunities to move resources out of public schools. All of the evidence shows that African-American and Latino children are far more likely than white kids to face suspension, expulsion, and even jail for misconduct. That holds true also for children with disabilities. Many of these disadvantaged children who need to be in the classroom instead are being funneled into juvenile detention and worse adult jails where many are exposed to brutality, making them more likely to drop out of school. Evidence and studies show us that the more times a child is suspended from school, the more likely he or she is to decide, you know what, you don't want me in school, I'll drop out. That's not a way to help our country succeed. That's definitely not a way to help children and families succeed. They are children like our client in Escambia County, Florida, an African-American student from a poor household who attended a magnet school he went to the wrong lunchroom one morning for the free breakfast that's offered to all the children, black and white, in that school, but was arrested for trespassing and then suspended from school for eating breakfast in the wrong lunchroom. Or our 14-year-old client in Meridian, Mississippi, who was removed from school and spent several days in a juvenile detention facility because he protected himself from a bully, as his teacher had told him to do. With zero tolerance policies, a child can no longer put their hand on someone who might be trying to hit them because that's considered, that's considered physical contact and, and violence. They're like the high school student in Mobile, Alabama who was suspended for 50 days because his, his shirt was untucked. Again, uniform policies, policies related to uniform and attire mean that you have to be dressed a certain way. In fact, this particular student uh, was one of just one in this instance, but earlier this year, a principal in the high school in Mobile, Alabama, suspended 97 children on the same day, all for uniform violations. And they are like the 11-year-old at a middle school in Highlands Ranch, Colorado, lest you think that all these issues are happening in the Deep South, 
who took a lollipop from a jar on a teacher's desk and was charged with theft. The boy was convicted of a misdemeanor and put on probation. It would be funny if it were not all true and so sad for what this means for, again, America's future and our children. There are countless other examples across America, and I would dare say in the state of California and other places that you may be familiar with. The vast majority of children thrown out of or arrested in school have done nothing to deserve such treatment. Many times they have not even committed crimes, but rather violations of school policies, infractions that should be handled in the classroom, not in the police station. We can and must do better for our children. Dr. King would expect no less of us. At the Southern Poverty Law Center, we're part of a national movement to stop these practices and institute new models of school discipline to keep children in the classroom out of streets and in jail and out of jail. The administration's plan to address the school discipline guidelines is an important step, a giant step in the right direction. I hope that the Department of Education will make this a priority and follow through with its commitment. This terrible pipeline isn't the only example of how children's civil rights for education are in peril. School choice systems such as the voucher program championed by Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal have seen their fair share of support and criticism. In August, the Justice Department attempted to block a portion of the Louisiana program, claiming that the vouchers issued in some of the jurisdictions impeded the desegregation process for districts that are still under federal desegregation laws. Still under federal desegregation laws 50 plus years after Brown v. Board. The growth of school privatization, charter schools, and efforts now that limit or deny access to education for children of immigrants or children who are immigrants themselves all fly in the face of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, violating certainly the spirit, if not the letter, of the law. The right to equal educational opportunities has been at the forefront of the civil rights struggle in the United States and remains so today. So what would Martin Luther King Jr. do? I believe he would organize and ask others to join him in doing so. He wouldn't sit by and watch as these structural issues and policies affect the lives of so many. And again, it's not simply the children of color, the communities of color who are affected by this, but all of us, all communities are affected when people who could become contributing members of our society, instead of being educated and learning and growing to be successful, are pulled out of society and into the justice system. I believe Dr. King would build coalitions of parents, teachers, administrators, school board members, and members of the community who support their public schools. I believe he would look to communities like Davis, California, to the Southern Poverty Law Center, and to organizations like the Dream Defenders, an amazing organization of black and brown young adults who formed their group in Florida, but are working all across the country to make a difference to demand fairness and equal opportunity. I believe that Dr. King would demand true education for all children. With all of us, I believe he would build a political movement so united and so clear in its purpose that every state capital and even in Washington, D.C. would be heard. In Dr. King's Nobel Prize acceptance speech in Oslo, again, just 50 years ago, Dr. King said this, I have the audacity to believe that peoples everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, and dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. I believe that, and I hope you do too. Thank you.
Thank you again, Dana Vickers Shelley from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Thank you so much. And your message is outstanding food for thought. For those of you who would like to talk to Ms. Shelley a little more, she'll be available after the Freedom March in the Hunt Boyer Mansion, two doors down from the theater. Now, we will wrap up our program with the Freedom Singers and a brief tri tribute to Terry Turner, who, who we lost last, uh, this year actually, we lost him this year. After a few songs, follow the Freedom Singers out of the theater, and they'll be led by Barry Melton and Dick Holdstock. Uh, follow, them, <clears throat> excuse me, follow them out of the theater to the ceremonial march around downtown. But first of all, we're going to start with uh, John Pamperin, who will give a tribute to Terry Turner. We, we were 1963-64 city champions in basketball, so I don't think that I can't walk anymore. <laughs> well, I, uh, I appreciate this uh, time to honor with all of you, uh, Terry, and uh, my new wife said, don't cry, and I just want to say that uh, I thought of this morning that in 1968, the uh, Experimental College had a course in Negro history. Uh, Terry did the teaching, I did the assisting, and we were to meet at our house on a, as I remember Wednesday, I may be wrong, and I had to call Terry and said, we have to change, we're going to have to have change tonight's uh, message. And he said, why? I said, Martin Luther King has just been killed. And uh, for both of us, it was a shock that these kinds of celebrations that we have about someone are real. Because some people do not like what we're trying to do. The other thing to say is that with your excellent guest speaker and with the children, you see what needs still to be done. And Terry, in his lifetime, stayed the course. So I'd like to point out not only in relationship to civil rights of all people, he and his partner went to El Salvador, went to all the Central America uh, civil rights type of activities and saw that a person injured in another part of the world is like injuring us in our part of the world. And that was his message of his life in which he was an artist and was able to uh, put in his paintings a sense of fairness and justice. Uh, just one last thing is that Dick and Cynthia and myself joined uh, Terry to campaign for Obama in his home area in Ohio which is just one of the privileges of our life together, was to see the effect of American politics and the next step of civil rights and justice for all. So I thank you for this opportunity, speaking too long, but God bless Terry. God bless his family, his partner, ex-wife, and grandchildren, who he so dearly loved. Thank you.
God bless you too, John Pampin. You're wonderful. Well, how, what, let's give him a big hand. He's there when you need him, but he's not up here to help me sing. I, I thought you were going to be up here as a freedom singer, well, we but God said. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we need to get all the freedom singers up here that we can. And now, come, come on, now, anyone that wants to be a freedom singer can be one right now. I mean, that's the way it works. And I want you to give a great big hand for the, the, the most wonderful guy I know, Barry Melton, the Mr. Fish. Of Woodstock and other place fame. So, um, I thought... Yeah, we're in love t shirt Look at all that. Yeah, it's great. We've got to have some more. We need some more freedom singers. Over. Come on, John. You can make it up here. So we're going we're to start off with a, with a song that we sang in the South. And, and uh, it's really important that we keep it alive. And uh, it's in the key of G. And if you don't know the words, don't worry, because we don't know them either. And the other part of it is that these are called zipper type songs. So we're just going to keep on singing zipper songs until we're tired of them. We'll walk right out and we'll be a part of the march, a very short march. Even I think with my illness, I can make it around. Got this terrible cold that's going on. Isn't it awful? Anybody else have that trouble? So, okay. Well, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom, stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on justice. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on justice. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on justice. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I woke up this morning with my mind Stayed on education Woke up this morning with my mind Sing louder! Stayed on education Louder! Woke up this morning with my mind Stayed on education Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah well, I woke up this morning with my mind Stayed on freedom Woke up this morning with my mind Stayed on freedom Well, I woke up this morning with my mind Stayed on freedom Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah
and we know he was removed. <laughs> Richard Nixon was president, and we know he was removed, just like a fly that stuck into the butter. He was fight for freedom and we, we shall not be moved. We will fight for freedom and we shall not be moved just like a tree that's standing by the water. We shall not be moved. Young and old together. We shall not be moved. Young and old To that land, come and go with me. To that land, come and go with me to that.